Hello, and thank you for joining us for episode 63 of the Aviation News Talk podcast, where we bring you general aviation news and relevant information that pilots like you can use. Now, that audio clip you just heard relates to our lead story about two flight school employees here in Northern California who've been charged with kidnapping a student pilot. And we'll have that story for you coming up in the news. Also today, we're going to hear from you as listeners tell us how they would like to see modern avionics improved. All this to help listener Jaden, who's an engineering student who just started his summer internship working at Garmin. And of course, we'll answer listener questions. Plus, coming up in the news, in addition to the kidnapping story, we have details on a new program providing free pilot training for veterans. But you're going to have to act quickly if you want to be a part of it. And one country is now making it mandatory that you land with a 30-minute fuel reserve and that you declare Mayday if you start to use any of that fuel. And those red blinking obstruction lights that we're used to seeing on top of towers and wind turbines, well, they may be going away. And we'll tell you the surprising proposal for replacing them. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm your host, Max Truscott. I'm here to educate and inform you as a pilot or student pilot, and of course, always try to have a little fun along the way. I'll be sharing my over 40 years of experience as a certificated pilot. I'm author of the G1000 Glass Cockpit Handbook and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year here in the U.S. I'm also a specialist in Cirrus aircraft like the SR-20 and SR-22. Now, in episode 62, we sat down and talked with Joey Ferrara of Garmin and talked about the Garmin GDL 52, which is a portable Sirius XM weather and ADSB traffic and weather receiver. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. And next week, we're talking with Mike Bush about his transition from high tech to general aviation maintenance and about his new book. All this and more, and the news starts now. From the Reading Record newspaper at Reading.com, and Reading is R-E-D-D-I-N-G, two Reading flight school employees were arrested and accused of kidnapping a student. The general manager at IASCO, flight training in Reading, and his assistant have been arrested on suspicion of kidnapping one of the students. Now, Reading is about 200 miles north of San Francisco in the northern part of California. And the IASCO flight school, as I've read, has about 180 students at any given time, most of whom are in from China training to become airline pilots. According to police, they were tipped off around 7.15 a.m. on Friday morning, that's May 25th, by the student's brother who lives in Shanghai, China. Bai Han Fu called the Reading Police Department after receiving information that his brother, Taiyan Shu Shi, was assaulted earlier in the morning, according to a police department news release. Officers went to the Reading Municipal Airport where IASCO trains its pilots and arrested Jonathan Lipton McConkie, age 48, about an hour after the call came into police. They also arrested Kelsey Hoser, who the department identified as McConkie's assistant. She, who also goes by the name Chris, was visibly distraught and shaken when he spoke to a reporter Friday afternoon from his home. She said he was feeling very bad and he was shaking, but his four other roommates were watching out for him. Quote, my inside is bad because I never had this experience before, he said of his mental state. During the morning incident, he alleged that McConkie came to his residence and was cursing. It frightened him, he said. Quote, he's very rude, used too many dirty words I can't describe. He alleged McConkie grabbed his right arm and hurt him and told him he needed to get on the plane to go to the Bay Area and on to China. She called his brother Fu in China to tell him what was happening. Fu, who she said spoke better English, reported to police what was happening to his brother. McConkey and Hoser were booked into Shasta County Jail on suspicion of kidnapping and conspiracy to commit crime. Their bail was set at $100,000, according to the jail's electronic custody listings. According to police, McConkey and Hoser, who's 50, went to the alleged victim's residence Thursday night to tell him they were sending him back to China. The pair returned to the residence Friday morning, and when the victim refused to leave, McConkey battered him and threatened physical violence if he did not go with them, police said. Fearing for his safety, she left with McConkey and Hoser, who took him to Reading Municipal Airport, police said. Officers found she, McConkey, and Hoser at the airport. She had minor injuries and was released after being questioned by police. 
It's not clear how long McConkie worked at IASCO. However, his business card lists him as Captain Jonathan McConkie, general manager. Now, the audio that you heard at the beginning of this podcast came from She's Smartphone. He recorded the encounter that he had on Friday morning, and a reporter from the Reading Record then copied that, and it's posted on their website. There is a lot of foul language included in it. It's not appropriate for this podcast. However, I have posted it. If you're interested in hearing the full tape, which is really quite stunning, you can go to our Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. There's also a link to it in our show notes. From military.com comes a follow-up on a story we talked briefly about a couple of months ago. It's about a new program to provide free pilot training for veterans. The Forces to Flyer program is its name, and it's a three-year research initiative led by the U.S. Department of Transportation and its Volpe National Transportation Systems Center. The program is designed to help ease the critical shortage of commercial pilots and essentially is a program to test the feasibility of training veterans to become airline pilots. Now, this program differs from the GI Bill. This part is a little bit confusing, but it says, if you want to use the GI Bill to get a commercial flight certificate, you must already have a private pilot's license. But that's not this program, because you are not eligible to participate in this program if you already have your private pilot's license. However, they say you can enter the program, get your private pilot's license, and then use your GI Bill for the remainder of the program. To participate in this program, they say you must have a first-class medical certificate, a student pilot certificate, and a letter of reference from a prior commanding officer, teacher, instructor, professor, or supervisor, or manager. If you don't have GI Bill eligibility, then you'll have to come up with $13,526 yourself. They say the program is an accelerated training program, and they've reported completing it in as little as four months. According to DOT, flight schools offering this training will provide the training necessary for up to 40 students to earn the following certificates and ratings. And then there's a long list that starts at private pilot, ending with a CFII. They say after receiving a CFII certificate, participants will be able to seek employment as flight instructors while obtaining the flight hours necessary to qualify for an ATP certificate and become an airline pilot. Currently, they say this is a test program to determine the interest in a training program for veterans to become pilots, and there are only four schools nationwide participating. One's in Bend, Oregon. One's in Millington, Tennessee. Another is in Denton, Texas. And the last one's in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. They say since this is a test program, vacancies are extremely limited, so don't delay in applying if you are interested. Check out the DOT Forces to Flyers website for details. And of course, We've got a link to that already up on our Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and there is a link in our show notes. From ForeFlight.com, ForeFlight customers invited to participate in MITRE Corporation's mobile clearance delivery testing. Would you like your IFR clearance in writing before talking to ATC? Well, of course, I certainly would. If the answer is yes, and if you file IFR flight plans using ForeFlight at the Manassas Regional Airport in Virginia, then you can help the MITRE Corporation test new clearance delivery tech. MITRE is researching how mobile devices can be used to deliver IFR clearances at airports not equipped with pre-departure clearance data comm clearance. Currently, pilots receive IFR clearances through telephone or radio calls to a flight service station or an air traffic control facility serving the area. These methods can be time-consuming and subject to interpretation errors. ForeFlight is helping MITRE facilitate the delivery of a text-based IFR clearance, so in the future, audio-based communication will be significantly reduced. They believe this could improve flight plan accuracy, reduce both pilot and controller workload, and reduce delays at non-towered airports. Manassas Regional is the initial location selected to test the concept with GA pilots. Participation is voluntary and available to pilots who routinely file IFR flight plans while departing from KHEF through ForeFlight. ForeFlight will contact eligible participants via email. The test at KHEF will commence on or about May 15th, 2018, and end no later than July 29th, 2018. Feedback received from this test will be used by researchers to determine any adjustments necessary to move on to subsequent phases of the test. Participating pilots will compare the text-based clearance received via email from ForeFlight to the audio clearance received from ATC. After filing a flight plan with ForeFlight, you may receive expected clearance information via email 30 minutes prior to departure. You will then contact ATC to pick up your clearance as normal. After the flight, you will provide feedback through the MITRE website about whether the email clearance information matched your actual clearance provided by ATC. From avweb.com, Textron shifts their focus regarding Cessna Pilot Centers. 
Textron is in the process of restructuring its CPCs or System Pilot Center network, including cutting back on the total number of CPCs and putting more focus on the digital interactive flight training curriculum that they offer through these schools. They say it's all part of their strategy to extend the reach of the Cessna curriculum to student pilots. In the process, the network of CPCs is going to transition to an exclusive group of flight schools that meet heightened qualifications. I think that means fewer CPCs. Until recently, the training curriculum has only been available to students at CPCs. This shift enables us to expand accessibility to the curriculum beyond the CPC network. Flight schools outside of the network may purchase the curriculum for their student pilot training programs. Other CPC benefits remain exclusive to the network. And those benefits include credits toward aircraft purchases, parts discounts, and free admission to instructional seminars. In order to implement its new CPC system, Textron is ending partnerships with quite a few of its more than 160 CPCs. Several flight schools that will no longer be participating in the program, including one that's been a CPC since 1998, told AvWeb that given the expense of new aircraft and parts, they are now having to look into options offered by other manufacturers. In addition, one school pointed out they will be unable to use any CPC branded materials, signs, or advertisements that they may have had for the school. The number of schools that will continue as CPCs has not yet been confirmed. The shift in how it handles CPCs is the latest in a series of changes to Cessna's approach to piston aircraft. Textron announced earlier in May that it will stop producing the diesel Skyhawk JTA. The announcement came less than a year after the aircraft was certified. The TTX high-performance single met the same fate in February. According to Gamma, Cessna sold 129 Skyhawks last year, which, though historically on the low end, still kept it as the top seller of training aircraft ahead of everyone except for Cirrus. So far in 2018, the company has sold just 13 Skyhawks, compared to 20 in the first quarter of 2017. From NewsChannel5.com, that's a Denver TV station, Air Traffic Controllers Union warns of delays amid controller shortage. The nation's air traffic control system is losing controllers faster than it can hire people, according to Air Traffic Controllers Union. Quote, if we don't have enough controllers to open up all the positions and we have to combine up positions, we have to reduce the capacity, said Paul Rinaldi, the union's president. He says the effects of not enough controllers have affected flights in the past. Quote, we have seen some situations last summer where we didn't have enough control at the facility where airlines did cancel flights, he said. Right now, we're at a 30-year low of certified controllers in a system. In 2017, 1,848 controllers left the job due to retirements, promotions, or other reasons, according to the FAA Controller Staffing Report released this year. The FAA hired 1,880 people to be new controllers last year. That's a gain of 32 controllers, but of the number hired, the FAA lost 735 people who did not pass the required training academy. Only 1,145 passed, far fewer than the number of controllers who left the job last year. Quote, we keep trying to keep up with attrition, and we haven't been able to do that, Rinaldi said. He says if the problem isn't addressed differently than it currently is, we can expect to be inconvenienced in the future when we fly. Quote, you will have some delays on the ground, maybe even holding in the air, depending on what the staffing looks like at that facility. From aircargonews.net, U.S. pilots are unhappy with an FAA study into single-pilot cargo aircraft. And of course, we all know that there are many single-pilot cargo aircraft today, smaller general aviation aircraft, but I believe this study is addressing larger jet freighter aircraft, such as the kinds of planes you see flown by UPS and FedEx. Now, U.S. pilot unions are unhappy with FAA plans to conduct a study into the use of single pilot cargo aircraft. Contained within the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018 is a program that would see the FAA, in consultation with NASA and other agencies, establish an R&D program in support of single piloted cargo aircraft assisted with remote piloting and computer piloting. Initially, the parties will conduct a review of FAA R&D activities in support of single piloted cargo aircraft and within six months of the enactment of the act, file report on the possibility. The study, which is listed in Section 744 of the act, was opposed by pilots on safety grounds. In a joint statement, Airline Pilots Association International and other unions said the professional cargo pilots of our collective airlines strongly oppose Section 744 and implore Congress to reject this provision without delay. They say by endorsing language that promotes single operator commercial cargo aircraft, Congress will undermine years of safety and security measures currently in place and put lives at risk. 
quote, the desire by some in our industry to pursue single piloted or autonomously piloted cargo aircraft seriously places the American public and the flight crews of these aircraft in a tenuous position. For many years, aviation has been the safest form of transportation in the U.S. This is by no means an accident. It's the result of a strong regulatory framework built over time, paired with an ongoing airline system safety culture that is one of the most ambitious in our nation's history. And I include this story not because it affects general aviation, but I think it does affect the long-term pilot shortage that we currently have. And I think one of the ways that that shortage will eventually start to go away a little bit is years from now when they start to fly large aircraft with fewer pilots. In international news from australianflying.com.au, new fuel rules mandate a 30-minute fixed reserve. New regulations around fuel planning will see CASA implement a mandatory 30-minute fixed reserve for VFR flight and a requirement to declare mayday if any of that fuel starts to become consumed. According to CASA, the new rules, which will start on November 8th, are designed to enhance safety and align Australia with international standards. The 30-minute fixed reserve for aircraft with a maximum takeoff weight of less than 5,700 kilograms will be reduced from the industry general practice of 45 minutes, which CASA says was in response to industry feedback. The main difference is that the reserve will, by regulation, need to be maintained. Quote, all pilots must conduct in-flight fuel management, including in-flight fuel quantity checks at regular intervals, according to CASA. When conducting these checks, you may discover that you would be landing at your original planned destination without sufficient fuel, that is, your fuel reserve remaining. If this occurs, make an alternate plan to land safely with sufficient fuel at a different location than you originally planned. Your new safe landing location will depend on your aircraft's capabilities and the conditions. In some instances, it might not even be an aerodrome, but could be a field. However, if a safe landing location is not an option and you are landing with less than your fixed fuel reserve, then you must declare Mayday Fuel. Under the new rules, pilots operating into controlled airports must contact ATC if they are in a situation where they will arrive at their destination with only the mandatory minimum fuel intact. If they calculate they will arrive with less than minimum fuel, they must declare a mayday fuel. If the destination airport is not controlled, the minimum fuel call is not needed. Quote, the mayday fuel declaration aims to increase safety, says CASA. It alerts other airspace users to a potential fuel problem facing an aircraft in their vicinity and ensures priority is given to that aircraft to reduce the chances of an accident. Mayday fuel is not aimed at setting conditions to prosecute pilots or operators, and a declaration does not automatically mean that emergency services will be mobilized. Changes to the fuel regulations can be read in full on the CASA website. And finally, from the BismarckTribune.com, that's a newspaper in North Dakota, new technology required for a Morton County wind farm, but not yet approved by the FAA. A wind farm west of Mandan, now that's in central North Dakota, is scheduled to be one of the first in the state to implement an alternative to blinking red lights, but the company says it still needs federal approval before installing the technology. North Dakota legislators last year directed the Public Service Commission to adopt rules that require light mitigating technology for wind turbines. PSC Commissioner Julie Federchak said state regulators had already started requiring alternative lighting for wind projects approved since June 2016 to address complaints from the public that the blinking lights ruined the night sky. Quote, frequently at our hearings, people who are opposed to the wind development talked about the annoying red blinking lights that were always on with no end in sight. If there's a solution to that, we ought to be adopting that technology. One technology option is known as the Aircraft Detection Lighting System, a sensor-based system that activates lights on wind turbines only as aircraft approach. Another option the industry is studying is a dimming technology that reduces the intensity of the lights when conditions are clear. Federchak said the state rules do not specify which technology companies need to use, allowing for flexibility as the technology continues to develop. North Dakota is the first state to require light mitigating technology for wind farms. Quote, like all new technology, it's probably not going to be perfect the first time around. There's probably going to have to be tweaks to improve this once it's out in operation, Federchak said. We're on the cutting edge of this industry nationwide. Well, I must say, I hope no aircraft flying become on the cutting edge of those wind turbines. They say the Oliver 3 wind farm in Morton and Oliver County is expected to be among the first in North Dakota to adopt light mitigating technology. Commission required in its permit that the wind project implement the technology by the end of 2018, subject to approval by the FAA. The owner of the project, Next Era Resources Energy, is waiting for guidance from the FAA before installing the technology. 
According to their communications manager, quote, we're anxious to put this into practice, but really waiting on the FAA because they have not yet approved the technology, quote. NextAira installed alternative lighting technology on a wind project in Arizona several years ago that has never been turned on because the FAA hasn't approved it. Quote, we as a company haven't had the opportunity to be able to fully test it the way we'd like because we have not gotten approval to be able to activate it. The Brady Wind Farms near Dickinson also have a December 31st deadline to install the new technology contingent on FAA approval. As soon as they give us the go-ahead, we'll be ready to install it as soon as possible. New state rules require all North Dakota wind projects approved after June 5th, 2016 to be equipped with a light mitigating technology system by December 31st, 2019. And that's the news for this week. Coming up, listeners tell an engineering intern at Garmin what they'd like to see different in future avionics, plus listener feedback and questions. Two listeners ask IFR questions, one about reporting of in-flight equipment failures, and another about whether to delete the airport from his flight plan so that it sequences in proper order to the instrument approach. Stick around. We'll be right back here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. In a moment, we'll hear from our listeners about what they'd like to see improved in modern avionics. But first, let me give you a few quick updates. Now, this one really makes me smile. I want to give a shout out to a friend of mine, Kelly O'Day. She is a colleague of mine who teaches at the Palo Alto Airport, a flight instructor. She's also one of our Patreon sponsors here, and she has a good sense of humor. She sent me a note a few days ago asking me if I had seen her in the centerfold of Flight Training Magazine. And I thought, well, she usually uh, centerfolds in aviation magazines have uh, you know, pictures of airplanes. Indeed, this does have a picture of an airplane, but it's got Kelly uh, standing right next to it. It's a great story. The title is You Can't Keep a Good Woman Down. And the subtitle, which I love, San Francisco Salon Owner Trades Silver Shears for Wind Shears. <laughs> Nice, nice writing there. And they tell uh, Kelly's story. She says that when she was a girl in the 1970s, her parents explained to her that she had these options. She could be a nurse, a teacher, a wife, or a hairdresser when she had asked them about attending aviation ground school at her local high school. So she believed what she was told, went ahead and attended cosmetology school, got married, became a successful hairdresser here in the San Francisco area. She talked with her husband over the years about uh, flight training. He said no. <laughs> she made a choice. <laughs> she uh, she did uh, have a divorce, and she decided to take up flight training. Now, years later, she's a flight instructor. She has sold off her salon, which I think she had for about 27 years. And now she's uh, fully transitioned into a full career as a flight instructor. So great article, great person. Kelly, thanks for sharing that with me. And again, that's in the June issue of Flight Training Magazine. And listener Nick Herring posted in the community section of our Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. He was writing about the live sectional map that some of us have been building uh, using the Raspberry Pi to display a map that shows lights that reflect the flight conditions, whether VFR, IFR, at different airports. He says, thanks for reminding me about this project. I always told myself I wanted to do. Well, I'm glad to say it's complete. And he attached a photo. He says the sectional represents San Diego all the way up to Port. California. Love the show and keep up the great work. Now, if you want to build one of these yourself, just go out to the blog section of our Patreon map and you can find the full instructions there. A couple of other people have written in about that. Travis Carney, who's also a Patreon supporter, says he's planning on making one as well, but he's going to use a contoured map. So you probably remember those from high school where they, uh, you know, they're not flat, but they stick up to reflect the terrain. He said he has one of those from 3D Aero Charts. And I found that company by looking up uh, summitmaps.com. So if you'd like to get a 3D contour uh, sectional map, you can do that. And also locally here in uh, my hometown here of Mountain View, California, Ron Klutz finished building his map. I have yet to see it, uh, but he's got that all up and running. He's actually going to build a second one. He wants to, uh, to make some changes. And as usual, I've been doing lots of flying. The weather's been good enough here the last week or so that I've made it out to Half Moon Bay, which is on the coast, often obscured by a fog. One of my favorite airports to fly out of. It's just beautiful as you make the turn from the upwind right turn to crosswind. You're right over the coastline, you know, passing over a lighthouse and a little village below. It's just spectacular. Anyway, a couple things that happened while we were out there. Uh, we had somebody call in. We had two of us in the pattern, and somebody called in. For, he was about seven miles out. Now, he didn't say straight in runway 30, but he did say runway 30. 
called in again about four miles. And as soon as he called in the first time, I said, you know, two in the pattern. And I thought maybe he would take the hint that, you know, straight ins according to uh, AC 90-66B, the latest uh, guidance for non-towered airports, are supposed to give way to people who are in the normal traffic pattern. And of course, this guy, as you're going to guess, just kind of went straight in. We uh, were turning base and of course, there he was right in front of us. So we went ahead and extended our downwind. And after he landed and was getting ready to take off again, I mentioned it to him. I said, hey, I was kind of surprised that you landed uh, straight in when there were several of us in the pattern, since the book says you know, people flying straight in should give way to people who are flying the, the regular uh, recommended pattern. And he said, oh, sorry, I'm a student pilot. <laughs> so anyway, hopefully as he and his flight instructor have a, you know, a little more of a discussion about what is the appropriate way to go into non-towered airports. Now, straight-ins are fine if you go to an airport that's not particularly busy. And I th also think that straight-ins make a lot of sense for large, heavy aircraft. Uh, you uh, really don't want to have one of those airplanes maneuvering around to enter on the 45 at high speed. Uh, so for sure, always want those guys to come uh, straight in. Uh, but, you know, we had a pretty busy airport there. We had uh, two people who were actively in the pattern. We had, I think, one on the ground ready to come up. As I left the pattern, we had two more that were inbound. So it was a pretty busy day. I think when the weather gets good, everybody enjoys uh, going out there by the coast. So that was kind of interesting. And then a couple of minutes after this gentleman uh, flew the straight in, my buddy Daryl showed up. He's a, a flight instructor who does a lot of face checks. And you know, what I love about him is he is a stickler for the, uh, the regulations. And the only reason I knew it was him was because about 10 miles out, the aircraft gave its call sign. And then for the entire rest of, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes it was there, it made every call saying, uh, Cessna Skyhawk, you know, left base, Cessna Skyhawk, you know, right base, so on. And no reference to the call sign whatsoever. And I mentioned to this when I bumped into him a day or so later, and he said, oh, yeah, a lot of people like doing it that way. And I said, true, but have you read AC 90-66B, which says that it's perfectly fine to mention the type of aircraft and the color, but that you should not omit your call sign, according to the latest version of this. And he was kind of surprised and said, oh, okay, they're probably doing that just so they can keep track of you. But since it's a regulation, I will follow it. And that's kind of the way I feel about things as well. And you really don't want to be picking and choosing which regulations you follow and which ones you don't, because that's a pretty slippery slope. So I always try and follow every single regulation, even if I don't always necessarily agree with it. In this particular case, I don't think it's that much of a burden to mention your call sign at a non-towered airport. After all, we're doing it all the time when we're at towered airports. So not that big a deal. And I'll be back on the road again starting next week. I'm going to leave in the middle of the week, uh, June the 6th. It's a Wednesday. I fly out to Knoxville, Tennessee, and then I'll spend Thursday and Friday the 7th and 8th flying back to California with the new owner of a Cirrus SR-22. So that's going to be a fun trip. And don't worry, however, we will have an episode for you that week. And next week, we're going to be talking with award-winning mechanic Mike Bush. So you probably don't want to miss that. Now, Mike and I are both going to be speakers the following week at the AOPA Regional Flying, which is going to be up in Missoula, Montana. It's coming up pretty quickly, June 15th and 16th. Friday is the day when there are paid presentations. Mike and I will be, I think, speaking in the same time slot. So you'll have to choose whether you want to learn about your engine or whether you want to learn about IFR uh, from me. But I hope you can make it. Come on up to Missoula. Sign up for that if you can do it. And, of course, uh, Saturday uh, is the big day when I think most things are free. And you've got uh, various other things going on, including the pancake breakfast, free seminars, and, of course, the pilot town hall meeting and ice cream social with AOPA Mark Baker, which occurs at 3 p.m. So just remember, Friday is going to be the workshop day. That's a $99 in advance. Includes lunch if you want to attend uh, any of the uh, workshops of your choice on Friday. And then Saturday is the free day. And I'll include a link in the show notes here where you can register online with AOPA. And there's also an item where you can click on if you want to volunteer to help out at that event. Now, if you can't make it to Missoula, Montana, well, maybe you can make it to one of the other three locations that are going to be held in the fall. I'll be at each of those. And I think Mike Bush will be there as well, too. And they include Santa Fe, New Mexico, Carbondale, Illinois, where coincidentally I was just there last summer watching the solar eclipse, and Gulf Shores, Alabama, which is a town where I've taught at the uh, Cessna uh, Clinic for uh, Cessna 400s. And that's a great little town. So I'm looking forward to be back in Gulf Shores, Alabama later in the year.
Hey, let's talk about Patreon for a couple minutes. I want to thank uh, two new Patreon supporters that have signed up since the last episode, Kyle Kobold. Now, Kyle is a Navy officer. He used to be hanging out right around this area down in Monterey, which I think has got to be one of the best places to be stationed. He just recently moved off to uh, let's see, Jacksonville, uh, Florida for his next assignment. He's got his private license and we were exchanging email about the forces to flyers program that we talked about in the news. He was a little disappointed since he has a private, he doesn't qualify for that particular program. And I'd also like to thank a new supporter, Nick Zaitis. Nick, I think, is also a ham radio operator as well as I am, and also, of course, is very interested in flying. So thanks to our new Patreon supporters. And I've got a couple of different things we've posted out there on the website since I last talked about this. One of our recent episodes, we talked in detail about go-arounds and how you can prevent accidents. Well, just a single day later, I heard about a really great video that I subsequently heard about from a couple of people. There is a YouTube video with a song. Uh, and the singer is uh, a pilot and it's called you can always go around <laughs> it's just hilarious so there is a link to that i suggest you go out to our patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome you're going to have fun listening to that uh, country song other things i posted there recently include an article about the new adsb weather products that are going to be released in june there's also an article which is essentially a roundup article on all planned electric aircraft, uh, both GA as well as the airliners. Uh, so if you're really interested in learning about electric aircraft, go on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome and click on the blog post area where you can see that. And then finally, I have posted the audio from the flight school incident. You can hear the entire uh, two and a half minute recording yourself and kind of decide uh, what you think really happened. Though I got to tell you, there's a lot of swearing by the flight school manager, uh, which is why I didn't include the full recording uh, on the podcast. And while you're there on the site, please consider making a contribution by credit card to support the show at different contribution levels. You get different goodies. For example, the $4 a month people can get access to all the original scripts for each show. And the $8 a month crowd, those donors see the news stories that I've had to cut because I didn't have room for them in the show. This week, we have eight stories we had to cut that didn't make it into this show. You can find all of this by going out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome because you're all awesome listeners. And you just click on the post button at the top of the page. Now stick around because in seven seconds, we're going to hear what listeners say about what they'd like to see in future avionics. And welcome back. You may remember that in February, I had an email from Jaden. He raised a question that we're going to be talking about right now. And let me just read that email from him again. He said, hey, Max, I've been listening to your Aviation News Talk podcast for about two months now, and I would like to ask for some help and advice regarding GA avionics. I'm currently a junior in aerospace engineering at the University of Kansas, and I've been hired by Garmin to work as an aviation systems engineer intern this summer. So lately, I've been trying to learn as much as I can about general aviation avionics and the G1000, G2000, and G3000 systems. Do you have any tips for getting up to speed with what's going on currently in the GA industry? Your podcast has been a great resource, but I'm looking for other ways to improve my GA knowledge base. As a pilot, what were your biggest issues with modern avionics systems? Are there specific features you feel that they lack? Also, what future avionics technologies are you most excited about? I'm a big fan of your podcast. It's very informative, and you're a great host. Thank you for all the time you put into making great content for people in the GA community. Thanks again, Jaden. Well, it took me a couple of months to figure out how to respond to Jaden, but I've always said we have the smartest listeners who listen to this podcast, and I finally realized that Jaden would get a much more comprehensive answer if I ask you to send in your feedback for him. And whenever I've asked you for help in the past, you've always responded, which you did again this time. Now, I had a recent email from Jaden saying he started his internship two weeks ago, so he still has the whole summer to hopefully work on some of the issues that you raised. Here's our first response from a lady who wants to be known just as Femme Pilot. Hi, Max. I'm an avid listener. Thank you for your very informative podcast. I'm responding to your question of the month about what are my biggest issues with modern avionics, what features they lack, and what are the future features you're most excited about? Ever since I've flown the G1000, I really love the functionality of it. I've grown so accustomed to the benefits to what the G1000 can offer. There are two things, however, that I want to be able to do with my current avionics that's not currently possible, or at least not that I know of as of this moment. I currently own a 2007 Skyhawk 172SB, 
which has a legacy G1000 avionics. The two things I'd like to be able to do is number one, be able to update my Garmin database directly from my iPhone or iPad without leaving the plane. At the moment, when I update my Garmin database, I have to get the SC card from my plane, leave the hangar, go to my computer at home and download it, and then go back to the hangar and upload it to the plane. This is quite tedious. I want to be able to do this without leaving the plane or without paying an additional fee to sync my database. I've heard of a system called AirSync, but I have to pay $999 a year to do that, and I really want to eliminate that. I also found this device called Wombat by BatElf, which will help me upload the Garmin database without leaving the plane. But unfortunately, this only works just with the Jeppesen, not the Garmin database, or at least as of this moment. Number two, I want to be able to seamlessly transfer my flight plan from my iPad to the G1000 via Bluetooth. And since I have a G1000 legacy, I'm not able to install Flightstream, which enables you to transfer your flight plan to G1000 NXI, but not the legacy G1000 per my avionic shop. So these are the two features that my G1000 lacks. And what I'm excited about is that learning that there may be a workaround for this or a device that can help me do this in the future. Thank you again for partaking your knowledge through your podcast. And here's to keeping the blue skies up. Thanks, Max. Thank you, Found Pilot. And yes, the Garmin G1000 NXI was just announced last summer, so not too many of those have shipped yet in Cessna aircraft. Uh, that does have an option for the Flightstream 510, which enables the database concierge, which is their wireless transfer of aviation databases from the Garmin Pilot app uh, back to your G1000 system. Now, I found when I had the GDL52, the first time I connected it to Garmin Pilot, it actually updated the firmware, which I thought was an amazing feature. It'd be nice if we had uh, some ways to update the G1000 uh, like that as well. Now the Flightstream 510, that's actually been available in the Cirrus perspective, which is a you know version of the G1000 for at least several years now. And I have used that to transfer flight plans back and forth between my iPad and the uh, perspective system in the Cirrus. Now let's take a listen to Dimitri. Hello, Max and Jaden. This is Dimitri from Central Maine. First, congratulations to Jaden on his exciting career step. A topic that I would like to discuss with an avionics engineer is crew resource management and having our avionics play the role of the second crew member during single pilot operations. I wonder if systems that allow the development of standard operating procedures for specific aircraft and then encourage workflows that follow these SOPs might improve safety. I'm a Cirrus owner, and there has been considerable discussion in the Cirrus community about how additional buttons and screens do not necessarily improve safety and may, in fact, be distracting. I am not sure if avionics should simply mimic two pilot operations with standardized callouts and challenge response checklists, or if procedures with a virtual crew member should be different from procedures with a human crew member. But I suspect this would be an exciting area to work on. I wish Jaden the best of luck in his career, and thank you, Max Trescott, for your excellent podcast. Dimitri, thank you for your outstanding response there. You know, you've covered areas that I never would have thought to uh, suggest to Jaden, so I'm really happy you brought those things up. You're talking about standard operating procedures and workflows. I find that those are probably the biggest area of difficulty that people have in instrument flying. They have to use different processes for different types of approaches uh, and for different uh, ways the approaches start, whether it's vectors or own navigation and things like that. So yes, yeah, some kind of standardization with highly defined workflows probably would improve safety, particularly, I think, in instrument flying. Now, as for additional buttons, that was actually one of the big improvements with the perspective in the Cirrus versus the G1000 found in other manufacturers' aircraft, and that was the elimination of all the redundant buttons. With a standard G1000, I believe the count's right around 102 buttons, and the Cirrus worked with Garmin to reduce all the redundant buttons, and that certainly made the layout a little bit cleaner. Now let's hear from Pedro. Pedro happens to be a friend of mine who also owns a Cirrus, and he's a flight instructor. Hi, Max. This is Pedro. I just wanted to share some thoughts for the intern, Jaden, with whom you have been working. I have three suggestions for improving the Garmin and other manufacturers' avionics. Number one, 
documentation. I don't want to have to wait for Max Trescott to write a book before I can fully utilize my instrument. The Garmin manuals are comprehensive but not easily navigated to help with the full real world scenarios. One idea I would love to see are small bite-sized video clips that demonstrate common scenarios paired with hands-on exercises to test my knowledge. Number two, I would be great if Garmin could provide APIs or some sort of framework for their simulators to be integrated with larger aviation simulation environments. Today, I run simulations on my iPad, but would love to be able to run them in a complete airplane simulation environment. Number three, the simulator databases should be simple to upgrade. Currently, they are not. The result is that pilots cannot practice the current approaches. Thank you, Max. I hope this helps. Pedro, thanks so much. Some great topics you covered there on documentation. Yes, the reason I wrote my original Max Truscott's G1000 Glass Cockpit Handbook was because the documentation just really wasn't up to snuff at that time. Now, it's certainly gotten better over the years, but I think that's a, a standard uh, complaint about avionics in general. As for APIs and being able to get simulations of the software into other simulators, that's a great idea. One of the things I've noticed over the years is often when I'm teaching in the simulator, I will be telling people people, yes, but in the airplane, it will act differently than this. And that's just because the manufacturers have such a hard time emulating things like the G1000 in every detail. They'll get the big stuff right, but they really miss the small, subtle stuff when they write those emulations. And yes, I have seen simulators that have databases that are a couple of years old, and so you end up flying old instrument approaches as opposed to the new current ones, which isn't great. One that works incredibly well, we have the Precision Flight Controls Simulator at the Flying Club where you and I teach. And I've noticed that that database is rarely more than one or two months out of date, so that's worked uh, particularly well for us. Let's hear now from Paul. Hi, Max. Hello, Jaden. This is Paul calling from Plano, Texas. My biggest issue with modern avionic systems is the apparent disconnect between what's in the plane and what's available to us to practice and learn on simulators in general and home configured simulators in particular. The issue takes two forms. The first example is the Garmin provided PC simulator for the G1000. It would be nice to be able to link the simulator version to the G1000 version in the plane. It would also be terrific if the simulator was officially supported on Windows 10, and I'd really like Mac OS. The second example pertains to G1000 functionality in simulators like X-Plane. It seems wasteful that each simulator supplier or third-party supplement has to work to emulate the G1000 both in implementation and testing. What might Garmin do to make these products more consistent with the actual avionics? I'm a big fan of learning avionics at home with books, courses, and a simulator before firing up the rental airplane and learning while the Hobbs meter is counting up my tuition. Good luck with your internship and an important career ahead. And thanks to you and Max for asking. Thank you, Paul. Well, you echo some of the points that Pedro made while adding some new points as well. And I like how you talked about studying in your simulator at home between flights. I think that's one of the biggest differences I've seen with glass cockpits. In the bad old days when we just had VORs, it wasn't really necessary to do practice at home between flights. Now, especially for folks who aren't out there flying every week, it really does help a lot if they spend some time reviewing and perhaps practicing in a home simulator before they come back to the airport because there's so much more information to know and it's a lot easier to forget how to use the avionics or some of the key features between flights. Now let's hear from Brian. Hi, Max. This is Brian from Reston, Virginia, with a couple of thoughts for Jaden, the intern at um, Garmin this summer. Uh, first of all, I would congratulate him. That's got to be a great internship to get into and a hopefully a, a doorway or a step on the way to a wonderful career in avionics and uh, aeronautical engineering and all the rest of it that um, that he's involved in. Garmin is clearly one of America's finest companies and he's in a great place. But then let me say this, which is not so positive about Garmin, in their avionics department, one of the things that would make life a lot better for pilots would be if there were some sensitivity about price on Garmin's avionics. Frankly, products, even products that have been out for 20 years, seem to not go down in price at all and not really get improved. On the first aspect, 
perhaps the FAA requirements for certification and so forth put a burden on the companies, but one would find in almost any other production of an electronic device that the steady production of the same item over time leads to economies in acquisition of parts and engineering and basically once you have paid back the cost of the initial engineering and design, the production of the device is usually not really that expensive. Yet, if you buy a Garmin 430W today, you're going to pay $8,500 for it, which is kind of a, you know amazing if you compare it to what you pay for a Garmin GPS device to use in your car, one which today has all kinds of features that they didn't have years ago and which um, has gone down in price and uh, has automatic map updates and everything included in the purchase price. I just think that there's maybe Garmin regards the avionics market as a cash cow, but uh, there doesn't seem to be, and maybe there's just not enough competition in that market. The other thing I would mention that it seems to me would really be beneficial to pilots and and the entire aviation community would be if Garmin would take advantage of the opportunities to update the software in Garmin devices even after they are sold. This is now true of so many products that you buy from Apple iPhones to Tesla cars that even after you have purchased the product, they continue improving it, and where it is feasible to do so, they send out software updates over the air or through some other means to enable your product to become even more valuable to you. And this, it seems to me, particularly given, to refer back to my first point, the price that you originally pay for some of these products, really would seem to be uh, the least that um, a company like Garmin could do. And they do it for some of their other product lines, Uh, particularly in the consumer automotive area. Anyway, those are my thoughts, and uh, I hope that Jaden has a wonderful summer. Brian, thanks so much for your comments. I can't speak for Garmin, but certainly having worked for a high-tech company, I can tell you that a lot of the profits uh, today get plowed into R&D for the future. And I think particularly something like the Garmin G1000, that had to be a huge investment over many, many, many years. And I'm sure that uh, things like the Garmin 430 and 530 profits from that helped to fund many years of development for the the Garmin G1000. So I'm sure that's part of the reason prices uh, don't drop because they've got bigger and bigger investments as they move up to larger and larger uh, avionics now that they're going after the jet market and and things like that. As for the automotive market, boy, it's got to be one really tough market to be in. For sure, the margins have to be lower there. There's a lot more competition. And I would agree with you. I think that they probably make much more money off their avionics business than they do out of the automotive business. And I have no insight you know, or in, internal knowledge about that. But uh, that just, to me, seems pretty obvious looking at it from the outside. Hope I'm wrong. Hope they're making lots of great money off of things like the automotive market. In terms of updating software, uh, there is actually a, a number of updates that are going on. For example, I mentioned the ADSB and XM weather receiver that we talked about in episode 62. That updated automatically when I connected it to Garmin Pilot. I was kind of surprised to see that, but great to see that it was updating the the firmware. I know for high-end systems like the Garmin G1000, they do uh, software updates, though. There you have to go to an avionics shop or your mechanic and have all that work done. Of course, you're going to get charged for that. So it would be nice if it were uh, easier to get uh, those kind of updates for, for larger systems. Now let's hear from Trevor. Hello. This is Trevor from DesertPilot.com. I wanted to add a few of my remarks about avionics. First, a story. When I first started flying with the G1000 to start my instrument training, the instrument instructor that I had had really no idea how the G1000 worked. We spent about 10 minutes on the ground getting the ATIS, trying to figure out how to change the altimeter setting. It was at that point that I realized he had no idea what he was doing, and eventually I changed instructors. But the thing is that the G1000 was incredibly complex and incredibly not really natural on how things are operated. I think a uh, case in point that uh, Max here wrote an entire book on how to operate the G1000. Now, I'm going to argue that you shouldn't have to have an entire book on how to operate any avionics system. The avionics system should be so natural that You should be able to get into the cockpit and know exactly what you want to do. Granted, I understand that instrument flying is 
not necessarily simple. So some of the functions, yes, you do need a little more complexity to it. But the basic functions of any avionic system, I believe, should be natural. I mean, my th if my three-year-old can operate my iPad on just about any app, just because he knows basic gestures and basic things to it, then there should be no reason why I shouldn't be able to operate an avionic system when I get into a rental airplane that I've never been in with an avionic system that I've never seen. Especially me as just as a weekend flyer, I don't want a super complex avionic system. I want it to tell me just basic functions and that I can look at the screen and understand what is going on and maybe make the avionics smarter. Just an example, use the altimeter. The avionics could easily figure out what phase of flight you're in. If you're on the ground and you're turning to the ATIS and it knows you're listening to the ATIS, maybe some way it'll bold or make prominent the altimeter so that you can turn the altimeter. Or versus if you're in the air listening to the ATIS, it should recognize that you're probably going to have to make an altimeter change when you're in the air as well. Little things like that just to make it smarter and more natural would be improvements, I think, to any avionic system. Thank you, Trevor. Well, you raise a couple of different points. One is if you find that a CFI in the right seat doesn't know what you need to learn from them, you should definitely switch CFIs. And there are times when CFIs will sit in the right seat and take your money while trying to hopefully figure things out faster than, than you do. And that's just not a great situation. And what you say is a great advertisement for my G1000 book. I don't promote it often enough for the show. So let me just go ahead and throw it out there. If you're trying to learn more about the G1000 or the Garmin Perspective in the Cirrus aircraft, you you can order my book, Max Truscott's G1000 Glass Cockpit and Perspective Handbook, by calling 800-247-6553. It's $34.95, and the warehouse will ship it right out to you there. And Trevor, you also mentioned that these systems are complex, and I couldn't agree with you more. Now let's take a look at an email received from Moj. He's one of our Patreon sponsors. He said, Max, here's my answer to the question you asked during the show. Comparing the G1000 to old gauge systems, I don't see any benefits in using analog gauges. Clearly, glass cockpit is the way to go. My answer is very different. If you ask me how it is as a computer system, terrible. My wish list of features is much longer than the CML can handle, so let's focus on the big picture. From Wikipedia, it says, quote, flying any glass cockpit aircraft requires transition training to familiarize the pilot with the aircraft systems. And then Moj says, do you need transition training to go from a rotary phone to digital to smartphone? What if someone asks you if they should get a rotary phone or smartphone? Is that even a question? The iPhone doesn't even come with a user manual. You don't even need to know how to turn it on. Just pick it up and boom, the display is on telling you what to do next, which is slide to unlock. Simple. That's how a glass cockpit should have been. What a smartphone is doing behind the scenes is far more complicated than the entire G1000 system combined, but the user interface is simple. As an example, the G1000 could display some old gauges people seem to love on its big displays. G1000 also lacks hardware integration, and a Cessna has no idea about trim position, flap setting, cow flaps, fuel gauge position, etc. It's slightly better on a Cirrus, but still far from where it should be. He says, I can talk on the subject for days. The sad part is that none of it is going to change, and nobody seems to care. Hmm. Well, I think things will change, and I think people do care. However, I think it probably is going to move at a much slower pace than any of us would like. I think the thing that people compare this to most today is what Moj mentioned which would be an iPhone or an Android a smartphone. We've seen tremendous changes and gains in technology in the 10 years that the iPhone has been out. Uh, the G1000 has also been out, uh, let's see, about 14 years now. And I think people would argue that it's not as easy to use and change has come a little bit more slowly to it. But I'd also hasten to point out that you're looking at a relatively unregulated industry, the telecommunications, that is, at least from the, the handset uh, standpoint, to a very highly regulated uh, industry with general aviation, with the FAA kind of looking over the shoulder of avionics manufacturers and uh, specifying some of the things that they have to do. And so change in regulated safety-oriented industries happens a lot more slowly. And that's because I think we're reluctant to make a rapid change that might end up compromising safety. That being said, yep, I get your point. It would be nice to see uh, things get a little bit easier to use and have that happen a little bit sooner. 
Well, Jaden, I hope this helps you out. I can tell that you're going to have a busy summer trying to fix all these things. <laughs> More likely, I think you'll probably be coming back to some data garment as a permanent employee, and it'll take an entire career to uh, to work on some of these things. Thanks again for your question. And for anybody else who wants to send us a question for the show, just go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener question at the top, and you can go ahead and record a question, and we'll play it. Speaking of which, coming up next, we've got lots of listener feedback and listener questions. We'll be right back. And before I get to feedback and questions, a couple quick thank yous for people who left reviews. This first one was in the Apple Podcast app, formerly called iTunes, and the username was Afito. He said a lot of nice things, but at the end he said, It's funny, I always thought you talk like a radio host. In a past episode, you mentioned that a long time ago you used to work in radio. No wonder, keep up the good work. Yes, I'm guessing there are also some other listeners that used to work in radio before a lot of that got automated. A lot of jobs were lost in the 90s when everything went to a satellite radio. But oh my gosh, was that a uh, fun time in my life. And also want to thank uh, MWATC, which I think stands for Midwest ATC. They left a review in our dedicated iOS app for Aviation News Talk, and you can find that in the App Store. And in part, they said, great podcast and good job, great work on your books. They were a must for me when transitioning to more TAA-style aircraft. So that's technically advanced aircraft like uh, glass cockpits. And it finishes up with a bravo from your friends at Memphis ARTC, which would be Memphis Center. So that's great. I'm going to definitely stop by next time I'm down there and say hello. Now let's take a look at some listener feedback. This came in from Rigger Runner through the Slack app for the Airplane Geeks podcast. And he said, you had a question a few weeks ago about required equipment when flying over water, part 91. In addition to your correct answer, you might mention that pilots flying from Florida airports like APF to Key West or FXC, that one I know, that would be Fort Lauderdale Executive, to the Bahamas, can usually rent life rafts and life jackets from the FBOs for the duration of their trips. Better safe than sorry. Yep, that's a really good point. In fact, folks that are flying the North Atlantic can rent all kinds of uh, things on both sides as well, such as a dry suit and things like that, which you might need for a trip. And this comes from Jan in Norway. You may remember we answered a question of his a long time ago about some of the anxiety that he felt. He said, hi, Max. It's a great pleasure that I inform you that I passed my skill test. That must be his check ride. Yesterday, after a total of 67 and a half hours, he said, listening to Aviation News Talk has been a great source of information and inspiration and will remain so for a long time to come. Special thank you for airing my question about anxiety and for contributing to solve it. And he says that he now has a license to learn and that he's going to enjoy the beautiful Norwegian nature with a bird's eye view. That's great. Thanks so much, Jan. Appreciate uh, your writing to us. And here's a note from Lance in Florida. He's a professor down there. He says, hi, Max. I wanted to follow up on our previous correspondence to let you know that I just passed my CFI check ride and I'm ready to join you in the ranks of instructors. Thanks for your encouragement and for the great content you produce with every episode. I'll definitely be encouraging my students to listen and subscribe now to begin studying for my CF double I. Well, that's awesome, Lance. Have fun teaching. I would say uh, jump into the cockpit immediately and start using some of those uh, new skills that you've gained. And this comes from Lyman. He's a Patreon sponsor regarding our episode on go-arounds a couple weeks ago. He said, I did what you described that students do. I arrested the descent, cleaned up, and then trucked along without climbing aggressively to get away from the earth. In other words, he was kind of flying level. He said that his instructor cured me of that with immediate verbal feedback, though. Well, that's good. I'm glad your instructor did what he's supposed to do, which is to let you know when you're not quite performing as optimally as you could. So, yeah. Yeah, no question on go-arounds. People often add some power, but they forget to pitch up, and they're just not climbing away from the ground. And Jan from Germany also wrote in. Jan's also a Patreon sponsor. He said, nice episode on go-arounds. He said his wife had to do a go-around two weeks ago when a landing aircraft in front of us didn't exit the runway, but continued to roll on the runway and then did a touch and go. It was for sure safer to not land, and the runway was not free. So yeah, that's yet another reason why you should do a go-around. But definitely check out the link that I've got in our show notes to the uh, You Can Always Go Around video. You'll certainly enjoy that. Now let's move on to some listener questions. This comes from an email from Ron here in California. He had a couple of different things here. He says, thanks for all the great stories, great info too on go-arounds. And then he moves on with a couple of questions about IFR. I'll pick up one of these here. 
He says, after loading the approach in a GPS, is it necessary to remove the airport in the flight plan as it's just before the approach section? So that's pretty common with a lot of GPSs, particularly the Garmin products, the 430, the 530, the G1000. You'll have your in route portion of the flight plan, then you'll have your airport, and then after that, you'll have the beginning of the instrument approach. So yes, sometimes people remove the airport so that they can let the uh, GPS sequence automatically from their in route waypoints directly to the initial approach fix of the uh, instrument approach. However, there's a huge disadvantage of doing it, which is why I never remove the airport, even though it does seem like it's in an odd spot. Here's the disadvantage. Sometimes ATC will call and tell you that uh, the approach that you had planned to fly is not available, and they'll offer you some other approach. And when you go to load that other approach, if you have removed the airport, your GPS is not going to know which airport you want to go to, and so it won't automatically present a list of approaches at your destination airport. You're going to have to back up, fill in the airport again, and then it's going to present you a list of approaches. So that can be pretty time consuming, especially if you're close to the airport and you're trying to reload an approach quickly. I find it's much easier just to leave the airport in there, use your cursor, jump over the airport, Put it on the first point that you want to fly to in the approach, which could be the IAF, or sometimes it's the IF, which is the next one, the intermediate fix. Just leave that airport in, but do a direct enter enter to a fix on the approach, and that will save you a lot of grief if midway through the process ATC asks you to fly a different approach instead. And here's a question that came in from an email from Jeff in Massachusetts. He says, I just finished listening to episode 59, and I have a question about reporting equipment malfunctions when flying IFR. I totally understand that ATC wants to know about GPS or VOR DME malfunctions so they can plan better, but is it really true for ADF? Since the special equipment code on the flight plan includes no information about ADF capability, ATC cannot assume that you can fly anything ADF anyway. And he goes on to say, yes, I'm aware of using GPS to identify NDBs is legal, but say you're flying a slant alpha. Now, that would be an aircraft with a VOR and a DME capability. And just to go back to your point about using GPS, yes, it has to be an IFR-capable GPS in order for it to be a legal substitute for NDBs or DME for that matter. And here's what I wrote back to him. I said, here's what it says in the AIM 5-3-3, and it says, any loss in controlled airspace of VOR, TACAN, ADF, which of course is the receiver you would use to receive an NDB transmitter, low frequency navigation receiver capability, GPS anomalies while using IFR installed GPS receivers, complete or partial loss of ILS receiver capability, or impairment of air ground communication capability, report should include aircraft identification, equipment affected, degree to which the capability to operate under IFR in the ATC system is impaired, and the nature and extent of existence desired from ATC. So he and I both agree, technically the rules do say, yes, if that 40-year-old uh, ADF receiver fails while you're flying IFR, the rule says you're supposed to report that. And I think the theory is, and it's pretty, pretty weak, frankly, is that uh, ATC might have a plan for you to fly something that you're not aware of. And so they need to be aware of any type of uh, deficiencies you have, any type of equipment loss. Though I would admit that, yeah, it seems pretty silly that you'd have to need to report the loss of an ADF receiver. But hey, those are the rules. Now, let me remind you to check out the bloopers at the end of the show. And if you have a question you'd like answered, just click on the artwork in your podcast player. You'll find my contact information and a link where you can go ahead and record a question from your smartphone or send an email or just go out to aviationnewstalk.com. And at the top, you can click on listener questions. Now, I would like to ask for your help on just one thing today. If you have a friend or two you think might enjoy the show, please tell them about it. That's how most people find out about the show. So that's the one thing I ask is let other people know about it. And if your friend doesn't know what a podcast is, well, just send them out to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store if they have an Android phone. And then you just search with these three words, Aviation News Talk, and you'll find our dedicated app in the App Store. Hey, and if you think someday you might want to buy a new or slightly used Cirrus, please contact me today. I can help arrange a free demo flight if you're thinking about a new Cirrus, but it can also help you understand the many factors about buying new versus slightly used. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the country. Hey, until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.
We have details on a new program providing free pilot training for veterans, but you're going to have to act quickly if you want to get be a blah, 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 GPS to identify NDBs as legal. But say you're flying an older... Blah, 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 blah. 